Good morning, good Sunday morning. It is good to be back in the house of God with you this this morning. Our Cheryl and I's travels are officially over for the time being. We didn't survive our last week on the road together. This time we just parked our own camper up at Lake Jordan and just kind of relaxed and rested from our from our previous two weeks exertion where she tried to get me eaten alive by wolves. But it is good to be with you here and we will definitely resume this coming Wednesday night or Wednesday night studies. So just get prepared for that email to come out and we will join together with you. If you missed Clyde's sermon this morning, his early message this morning, you missed a good one. He was talking about Zacchaeus and he's talking about how, how we need to be like Zacchaeus and how we need to seek Jesus, to seek who Jesus is and that we need to be affected by Jesus. In other words, that, that when Zacchaeus met Jesus, when Zacchaeus sat down with Jesus in his house, it changed Zacchaeus. It changed him. It changed him for the rest of his life. And brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus offers us. Matter of fact, that's what God commands of us. We often phrase it that way, that Jesus is pleading with you to, to accept him. But the truth of the matter is, we're commanded by God to accept his son. That's the command of God. Witnessing, evangelism, is sharing the command of God to accept his son's sacrifice on our behalf. That's what evangelism is. Today we're going to look at, as we continue through the book of Acts, we're going to look at two men who were changed with Jesus. They were changed to a certain extent that they understood it was a command of God to accept Jesus. Matter of fact, they understood more than that because brothers and sisters, after you meet Jesus, after Jesus changes your life, we're to, we to obey him. And one of the things that he has called us to do is to call the great commandment. But too often times, modern church, modern Christians consider it a great suggestion and not the great commandment. It's not optional to share your faith. It's not. It's a command directly from God. As Clyde talked about this morning, we all have a testimony, all of us. If you have been touched by Jesus, if you know Jesus, if you have been saved by Jesus, you have a testimony. Well, Peter and John had some testimonies. And we talked about last week, Peter and John are going up to the, to the daily 3 p.m. prayer at the temple. And they go up to the temple and there's this man who's been there 40-some years. We're going to see that today in today's scripture. This man's over 40 years old. He's been lame from birth. He's never walked. The only thing he does day after day, he goes to the temple courts and lays there at the beautiful gate and begs for alms so that he can get something to eat. Peter and John have walked by this man many times. But also, Clyde talked about this morning, when Jesus comes walking down the street, he means to see Zacchaeus. It was Zacchaeus' day. It was Zacchaeus' time. Perhaps this is the time, this is the day that God has ordained for you to, to meet his son. But that was the day that Zacchaeus was to meet Jesus. Jesus says, as Clyde talked about this morning, and I'm sorry if you missed it because I really enjoyed it and it really spoke to me. And I had never thought about that. Zacchaeus is up in a tree. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry down from there. I must stay in your house tonight. I must. Why? Because God had ordained Zacchaeus was going to meet his son now, today. Last week, Peter and John are walking to the, to the temple to pray and the Holy Spirit spoke to them and said, today is that man's day. You stop and you notice that man today. It's that, day, it, it's that man's day to meet the Savior. So Peter says, I don't have any gold, I don't have any silver, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And the man is instantly healed. Well, that brings the first persecution to the church because right after that, Peter preaches that beautiful sermon and all of these people are gathering together in the temple courts. It's an uproar. Here's a man that all of them knew. Had all of them, they had all known him all their lives. And now he's not just standing, he's leaping and dancing and jumping for joy. It's caused quite a scene. So let's pick up the story in chapter four, uh, four <coughs> beginning in verse one. And as they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. 
And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men. They were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who had been healed, who was healed, standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall... <coughs> excuse me. What... <coughs> got something in my throat. But seeing the man who, had, who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach, at all in the name (coughs) of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, (coughs) Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people were all praising God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. You know, one of the good things about going on a vacation, I didn't have allergies until we got back to North Carolina. I didn't have the sniffles. I didn't have the drainage down the back. I had nothing. It was blissful for a couple weeks. But as soon as we got back in North Carolina, I'm telling you. Anyhow, what we see in today's scripture is that Peter and John became they became effective witnesses for the gospel. Remember, this is the same Peter just a few weeks, a few short weeks before. Peter was so frightened at these very men, the Sanhedrin, Caiaphas and Annas and the temple guard. Those were the most powerful Jewish people in the nation. Those three men at that time, the most powerful. They had been instrumental in crucifying Jesus. They, they, they railroaded the Romans to crucify him. They railroaded Pilate to crucify him. They actually forced Pilate to crucify Jesus when Pilate understood he's an innocent man. But he didn't have an option because of these powerful men. They were not above using intimidation to get their way. They were not above using their power and the threat of, of intimidation and the threat of punishment to cause people to do what they wanted them to do. Peter understood this very well the night Jesus was arrested. He understood it so well that he ends up lying to a servant girl, a lowly servant who had no power. No, I, didn't, I don't know that man. I don't know Jesus. I wasn't with him. He's terrified out of his wits. This very same Peter is standing in the council, in the Sanhedrin, in the very room that these men, it was like the Supreme Court and Congress all rolled up into one. They had all the religious power in the nation. They had much of the civic power in the nation. Those things that weren't left to the Romans. The Romans let that, that the people govern themselves. As long as they didn't step on Rome's toes and as long as Rome got their taxes, it wasn't a big deal to let them govern themselves. These men were the power of the nation. 
Now here comes the temple guard. Paul and <coughs> Peter and John had just miraculously healed this man through God's work, through the Holy Spirit of God. And they're explaining, hey, it's in Jesus' name. We didn't do this. Remember last week when he says, what are you looking at us like, like we did it in our own righteousness? It wasn't us. It's in the name of Jesus of Nazareth that this man was raised, that this man was healed. And while they're doing that, people are gathered around. Here come the temple guard, the one who had arrested Jesus, to, to, or the, the temple captain, the guard captain, the one who had arrested Jesus to turn him over to the Romans to be crucified. Here, come, here he comes after Paul. I mean, Peter and John. The same Peter that was a frightened of a lowly servant girl is arrested by the man who arrested Jesus to crucify him. Thrown, him, thrown in jail overnight. I don't know where this notion comes from that, well, some of it comes from that false teaching out there that purports to be Christianity. That Jesus will protect you. He'll protect you from everything. Your life will be great. You won't have any difficulty. You won't face any problems. Right? You come to Jesus. He wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That's not, that's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible anywhere. Jesus says, you, come, you follow me and the world's going to hate you. The world's going to persecute you. All who desire to live godly lives will face persecution. That's what the scripture says. All of us. If you want to live a godly life, if you want to be an effective witness, you, you need to expect opposition. <coughs> and opposition, this is... This is this is a dirty secret of, of churches. Most of the opposition you will face comes from inside the church. That's the honest truth. You know, the pagans out there, they don't really care what we do in here. They really don't care what we're doing in there, here today. As long as we're not bothering them, they don't care. But opposition to the proclamation of the gospel most often comes from the religious establishment. That's what happened with the nation of Israel. This is the religious establishment. They didn't want the gospel being preached. They didn't want God's truth being taught. Why? Because that would threaten their power. That would threaten their prestige. That would threaten their livelihood. The Sanhedrin at that time were, were dominated by the Sadducees. The Sadducees were people who, who did not believe in, in resurrection. They did not believe in life after death. They did not believe in, in angels and, and such. That's why you see Jesus is confrontational with them. And that's why Peter, uh, Peter mentions who God raised from the dead. He's throwing it right back at him. You've got it all wrong. Your understanding of the scriptures is wrong. That's what he's saying to the, to the Sadducees. Your understanding of the scripture is all wrong. And because your understanding of the scripture is wrong, you killed the cornerstone. You killed the one God sent because you don't understand your own scriptures. They're the religious establishment. That's not going to set over well with them. But we're going to face opposition if we promote the true gospel because the true gospel, here's what it does to a person. Every time a person hears the true gospel of God, that we're all worthless sinners in need of a Savior, it throws human pride out of the equation. You have to look at yourself as God sees you. That's a tough thing to do. I like to look at myself and compare myself with, with somebody else out there. I like to compare myself with, you know, one of them bums that stand there and try to get money from you so you can go get another drink of liquor or whatever they're doing with it. I like to compare myself to them. Why? Because I stack up pretty well. But when I compare myself to God, I'm on the level with them. I'm on the level with the worst sinner who has ever lived. That's how I am to God. Well, you can't do that. You can't be introspective that way and feel good about yourself. If you can, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand how God sees you. These men did not understand God's word. They did not understand how God related to them. They did not understand how God saw them. So Peter and John share the true gospel. You know, we often say, we want to be like Jesus, don't we? Don't you hear that all the time? I just want to be like Jesus. But most of the time, what we really mean is, I just want to be like the parts of Jesus that are easy. The parts of Jesus that are nice. The parts of Jesus that are like a, an ancient day hippie skipping through the flowers barefoot. You know, that's what the Jesus we want to be. You know, the children come and we put them on our knee and we heal the sick people and we reach out to the, to the lepers. We, we do those things. Yes, that was part of Jesus. 
But that's not who Jesus is. Jesus was one of the most con uh, confrontational figures in all of history. Jesus provoked these people. He called them whitewashed tombs. In other words, you're dead inside. You just pretty up the outside. He called them hypocrites numerous times, a pit of vipers. He's in one of them's house for dinner. And he deliberately skips that ceremonial washing of his hands so he can, he can be confrontational with them. And they say, why aren't you washing your hands? Uh, boy, he, let, he lets into them. He teaches the, you teach man's commandments as God's commandments. You don't, in other words, you don't understand anything. Remember the Sermon on the Mount? When Jesus comes and teaches, you've heard it said, but I say to you. In other words, he's saying what you've heard all your life from these, from these whitewashed tombs, this religious establishment, is wrong. They don't understand what they're talking about. But I say to you, I'm speaking with authority. Here's what God's word really means. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is about. It wasn't new stuff that Jesus was introducing. It was the stuff that was in the Old Testament from the beginning that had become so twisted in man's understanding that it no longer resembled anything that God intended. But we do the same thing. Many in Christianity do the same thing. We fail to understand what the true gospel is. And instead of coming to Jesus with nothing, as the song said, I want to stand dressed in his righteousness alone. And instead, we come in our own righteousness. We come to God and say, God, I went to church. That made me good, right? That made you happy, right? I gave some money. That made, that made you happy, right? I'm good with you, right? Aren't you pleased with me? God, I, you know, I, I, I support the orphans. I, 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 I. None of those things are bad things to do. Matter of fact, those things are we are commanded to do. But we don't do them in order for God to be pleased with us. We can never please God in our own efforts. We do them because he has given his righteousness willingly through his death on the cross so that I can stand in front of the throne of God faultless. I love that song, Faultless. Do you like that song? Mercy me, faultless. Look it up. Love that song. God has made me flawless because he put his son's righteousness onto me. Peter and John understood that. They were no longer afraid of these people. To be an effective witness, you must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this is not the same as baptized by the Holy Spirit. You get baptized by the Holy Spirit one time. The instant you accept Jesus' sacrifice on your behalf, the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the family of God. He marks you as a seal, as a guarantee that you belong to God, that you were covered by the blood of Jesus. But we must continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. Somebody once said, I don't, I don't remember who it was, somebody once said, the reason we need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit is because we continually leak. We're a leaky container because we're still in our flesh. We still fight our sinful impulses. We still fight our flesh. The Apostle Paul used this metaphor to, be talk, to talk about being filled with the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. So what does it mean to be filled with the Spirit? To be filled by the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. To be controlled by the Spirit. To desire to serve the Spirit. And you, it's not some big fancy ceremony that you need to go to. Here's the only requirement to being filled with the Holy Spirit. Get the sin out of your life and submit to God. That's it. If you get the sin out of your life so there's no distance between you and your Creator and you desire to do what He wishes you to do, the Holy Spirit will drive you. He will control you. He will fill you. I cannot go witness to somebody and share the gospel and expect results to happen if I'm not relying on the Holy Spirit. I don't care if I'm a preacher. I don't care if I'm Dr. So-and-so has got all them letters behind his name. He can't do it either. Peter and John couldn't do it. Paul couldn't do it. None of them could do it unless they were being used by the Holy Spirit of God. That's where the power of the gospel comes from. Remember, Scripture says the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the world. 
It makes no sense until the Holy Spirit enlightens them. Then they see that it is the power of God and salvation. The crucifixion of our, our creator is what allows us to live forever. Yeah, it doesn't make sense to the world until the Holy Spirit enlightens them. You know why Peter and John were different this day than they were a few weeks beforehand? Because now they have the Holy Spirit and it's controlling them. Remember, this is the whole reason they stopped to, to heal that man. The Holy Spirit said, do it. They did it. They're arrested. They spend the evening in prison. They spend the night in the, in the jailhouse. The next morning, they're brought into the very council chambers. It says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, it says, you killed him. It's in the name of Jesus that this man is raised, the one you killed, the one who was God's cornerstone. Ellen didn't know what my scripture was this morning. We don't, we don't coordinate that. I kind of smiled when, you, when that email came from you. Here's the songs from Sunday. Cornerstone, I love that song. Jesus is the key, chief cornerstone or the capstone. He's the most important thing in all of the universe. This man, Jesus. Effective witnesses have spent time with Jesus. One of the most beautiful things that could be said about anybody or said about Peter and John right here. You know, these are ignorant men. They're just them stupid fishermen from up in Galilee. Yeah. But they were, they were amazed with them. Why? Because they recognized they had been with Jesus. What did they recognize about them that they had been with Jesus? Because they were being as confrontational as he was. They were being like Jesus. Being like Jesus is not all sunshine and puppies and singing you know, sappy songs. No. Being like Jesus and being an effective witness means that we must learn from him, that we must do the things that he did, that we must confront false doctrine. Now, that doesn't mean we need to be hateful. You know, we still have the... If, if we have the gifts of the Spirit and being filled with the Spirit, part of that is kindness and patience and gentleness. But we must kindly and gently stand strong for the faith. We must kindly and gently make sure that false doctrine is not named among us. We must make sure that when people are teaching the false doctrine, we don't turn our head and say, well, it's on them. We need to lovingly and gently tell them the truth. And in order to do that, in order to be able to do that, Guess what? You've got to spend time with Jesus. Can somebody say about you honestly? Look inside yourself. Can somebody say about you, hmm, I recognize they've been with Jesus. Sadly for most of us, no. We don't look any different than those people out there. Those people who have never met Jesus. Those people who have never picked up the scripture. Those people who have never bowed their heads in prayer. We look just like them. We do the things they do. We talk the way they talk. We dress the way they dress. Well, I ain't got any I don't care how you dress. My point is, there's nothing about us that, that screams out, they've been with Jesus. Them people's with Jesus. They've been with Jesus. They've been in his word. They spent time in prayer with him. That's what they saw about John and Peter. They'd been, they recognized they had been with Jesus. You cannot be an effective witness if you don't spend time with Jesus. That's what made them an effective witness. The Holy Spirit gave them the words to say. But the fact that they looked like Jesus, they talked like Jesus, they acted like Jesus is what gave power to the words. The world will never listen to us if there's nothing different about us. I said, well, you are no different than the Buddhist or the Hindus or the Jehovah's Witnesses. There's nothing different about you. Brothers and sisters, we have to be different. We have to. Or we'll never lead anybody to Christ. The world needs to look at us. And as Peter says later in his life, when he's writing his epistles, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is in you. That means people should see such a difference in us that they come up to us and say, what is wrong, what, what is wrong with you? What is, what is different about you? Why are you so joyful? Because I've been with Jesus. Ask yourself, can people look at me and know there's a difference from the world? To be an effective witness, 
we have to testify about what we know. And you said, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. Well, that's what Peter and John do. They knew Jesus res, re, was risen from the dead. They knew that Jesus had done that miracle through them. They knew that miracle was of Jesus. They knew it, that God raised him from the dead. They knew that he was crucified. They knew that he offered salvation. Well, brothers and sisters, we know the same stuff. We know Jesus was crucified. We know he was resurrected. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus' was, body was still in the tomb when Peter and John were standing in the Sanhedrin, don't you think the Sanhedrin would have just dragged the whole kangaroo court down to the tomb and said, there he is? Never once in the scriptures or in any secular history does the Jewish hierarchy, the Jewish leadership ever try to refute, refute, refute the fact that Jesus was no longer in the tomb. Not one time. Even in hostile sources, ancient hostile sources, they recognized they couldn't. They couldn't. Why? Because his body's not there. Christianity would have died an instant death if they just rolled his body out of the, the tomb and walked it through the streets of Jerusalem. Here he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. No, they couldn't. Why? Because he's gone. Tomb's empty. Tomb's empty. There's a book, Who Moved the Stone? It was written by an atheist who set out to disprove Christianity. He understood, just like the Apostle Paul understands, just like we should all understand. All of Christianity hinges on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If he hadn't been raised, Paul says, your faith is in vain. You are the worst, most miserable people on the planet. But he has been raised. Frank Morrison started writing this book to disprove the claim that Jesus was, was God's son who was risen from the dead. It's the first sentence in the book. The book that refused to be written he ends up calling the book Who Moved the Stone? Because he recognized that the evidence, the historical evidence from the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most well-attested fact in all of human history. If you're interested, we can go over it. Uh, there's a ton of evidence that Jesus Christ is in fact alive three days after he died. They knew that. You know that. It's the most attested fact in history. Everybody knew the tomb was empty. The Romans knew it. The Jewish people knew it. His disciples knew it. They hadn't seen him. They had met him. They had spent time with him and he changed them. Brothers and sisters, if you've come to know Jesus, as God talked about this morning, he's changed you. If he hasn't changed you, you need to wonder about your relationship with Christ. Do you even know him? Because you cannot meet Christ and remain the same. You cannot. He won't let you. He'll change you. They had been changed. That's what they knew for certain. We know it for certain too, those of us who have accepted Jesus. They knew that the miracle had been done in Jesus' name. Well, brothers and sisters, Jesus is still doing miracles today. He's done some in my life, and I'm sure he's done things in your life. I know that for certain. These are the things that we are to share. We're to share the fact that, that everybody is helpless and hopeless and has no hope. That man could not have healed himself. That lame man had been there 40-some years. He couldn't heal himself. It wasn't until the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's the last thing we need to do to be an effective witness is to proclaim the fact that it's only found in the name of Jesus, that only faith in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ through his grace is salvation available. I know today's watch word is tolerance. Well, brothers and sisters, Jesus was one of the most intolerant people who has ever existed because he didn't say, okay, there's many ways to God. You just do what you do. You know, that's how the world looks at us, right? We don't care about you. If you want to believe that, you believe that. It's great for you. Don't push it on anybody else. Let the other people believe. Let the Buddhists believe what they believe. Let the Mormons believe what they want to believe. Let the pagans believe what they want to believe. No. Brothers and sisters, there's only one way to God. And you said, well, you know, some of the Mormons, they're the finest people I've ever met. They're nice. They're polite. They're clean. And they are. I like them. As people. 
but they're dead wrong about their salvation. Oh, Jehovah's Witness are fine folks. I served with some. Fine folks. They look more religious than we do. They might be sincere, but they're dead wrong, and they'll never get into heaven by counting on their good works, by counting on what they do. See, that's, the, that's every false understanding of the gospel that has ever existed is that one sticking point. Every false one says that man must do something to earn God's favor. You must knock door to door. You must do your, two, your missionary thing on the bicycles and the white shirts or whatever. You got to go to mass and say the rosary. You got to give money. You got to do, 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 do. All of those are false gospels. They will never get you into heaven. The only thing that gets you into heaven is trusting in Jesus Christ and him alone. That means you bring nothing to the table. You bring nothing but your filth to the Savior. And he washes you in his blood and cleans you up and gives you his righteousness. That's how you get to heaven. Brothers and sisters, if we cannot stand up and proclaim that Jesus is the only way, we'll never be an effective witness because that's the truth. Jesus is the only way to God. Notice what, what Peter says. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which you must be saved. No other name. It's the name above all names. It's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that that man was healed. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that I was healed. That I was healed from my sin. That I was healed from my exile from God. That I was healed to spend eternity with him in heaven instead of eternity alone outside of his presence in hell. That's where all those sincere but false religions are leading people. Eternity outside of anything good, anything beautiful, anything light, anything that speaks of pleasantness. That's misery we can never understand. But that's where they're headed. Unless God's people go out into the world and start treating it like it's the great commandment and not the great suggestion. It's not just commanded to the missionaries and the preachers. It's commanded to all who name the name of Christ. Let's resolve as Unity Baptist Church that will be the hallmark of this body of believers as it was. Directly following their release when they had been threatened to no more preach in the name of Jesus. You know what Peter and John do? They go home and call a, a prayer meeting to pray for more boldness to share the gospel. That's how I want to live my life. I hope that's how you want to live yours. Father God, thank you for these, your people. Thank you for another day of opening your word and gathering together. Father, we ask that you would be with those who, who are either traveling or are not feeling well this morning, Father, couldn't be with us. We ask that you would just wrap your loving arms around them and let them know that, that we love them, that we miss them, and that we ask your protection upon them. Father, we ask as we think about the word this morning that we, you will show us, honestly show us, Father, Truly show us where we are falling short. Help us, Father, to also pray for the boldness to share the gospel to all we meet. Help us, Father, to be filled with the Spirit, to be guided with the Spirit, to walk by the Spirit and not by our own flesh so that we can be, we will be effective witnesses for you so that we will also see new brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's in his precious and holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. Stand with me as we...